March, getting ahead of me getting ahead of myself. The February Civic Coffee, happy to be here, joined by three great panelists today. Um, uh, I am just going to do a quick check to my colleagues who are in the room and make sure you can see us, hear us, we sound okay. So if someone can shoot me a message, that'd be great, but I'll just keep it rolling. Um, so welcome again to the February Civic Coffee, where we are being hosted once again at the Lake City Community Center. So thank you to our friends in Lake City for hosting us. We on the screen are joining you virtually, but there are many people gathered in person having real coffee and food in Lake City. And I'm being asked to share my screen, which I'll do in just a minute once I find my PowerPoint. Um, and so know that this is a hybrid event. We'll be taking questions from the audience as they come in, as well as um, from online folks who may be joining us via Zoom or on Facebook Live. We've got folks monitoring the chat. So feel free to ask us your questions along the way. I'll try to do you justice and relay those to my panelists. And um, I see a note in the chat about Cantonese interpreters. And yes, we are interpreting this event live in three different languages today. So if you are in the room, we have interpreters available in Spanish, Mandarin, and Cantonese. And I'm gonna let some of my more tech savvy colleagues answer our uh, question about online closed captioning. So hopefully we can make sure that everyone gets the language access needs met. So with that, I will now go ahead and share my screen. So try to, thanks for bearing with me here. Okay, I think we are in business. So again, someone please, uh, let me know in the chat if if something goes off the rails, but otherwise, I'm going to just keep us moving along here. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about access to care, um, which is something near and dear to my heart, as well as I know to all of our panelists. So looking forward to sharing that um, with you all. But I first do want to start off with a land acknowledgement, which is something we do every month and something which the city of Seattle really encourages us to do when we're doing internal as well as external meetings and really just taking a moment to acknowledge um, the traditional lands that we are on um, physically and virtually today. Um, these are the traditional lands of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present. Um, we really do honor with gratitude the land itself as well as the Duwamish people's stewardship of the land. Um, and if you don't know much about the Duwamish tribe, we really do encourage you to check out um, the duwamishtribe.org, uh, where you can learn a lot more, and including real rent Duwamish, um, if you're looking for tangible actions you can take. Um, so we have with us panelists from the Seattle Indian Health Board, as well as Providence Elder Place. Um, both of which are local to the Lake City community. Uh, Seattle Indian Health Board has just opened a satellite site over in, in the Lake City area. And Providence Elder Place provides care to folks all over the place, uh, including Lake City, and provides transportation access to get to their physical locations as well. So um, this is very timely discussion to have with the Lake City community. And before I go too much further, I do want to acknowledge our partnership with the Seattle Public Library. Um, we do these events, I think, for the last two years, if not longer, in partnership and, and super grateful to have their partnership in these events. Um, Emily, I'm going to invite you to say a few words if you are in the room um, and if we can hear you. No announcements from the room. Okay. Well, then I will just remind folks that the library is offering free tax help. I know taxes can be intimidating for most of us. Um, so 
do check out the resources that they're offering um, as it's that time of year again. Okay, and with that, I'm going to first introduce our uh, panelist, first panelist, um, and then I'm going to be handing the floor over to them for most of this discussion. Um, but Dr. Sosha Love Thurman is just is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, and also the Uchi in Delaware. Um, she attended the University of Oklahoma, where she studied both microbiology and Native American studies, which sounds like a pretty amazing combination. So thanks for sharing your knowledge with us today. Um, and she now serves as the Chief Health, Health Officer of the Seattle Indian Health Board. She oversees the health and human services there. Um, she also continues practicing, providing primary care services to people of all ages, um, specifically interested in women's health, including pre and postnatal, um, procedural skills, point of care ultrasounds, and native health equity. Dr. Love is also appointed to the health and sanitation position on the Washington State Board of Health. Um, and she loves to explore the Pacific Northwest with her husband and her three young children, dancing traditional Southern buckskin at powwows, cycling and swimming, and engaging in social justice work. So thank you for being here, Dr. Love. And next we have Jeremy. So thank you for being here, Jeremy Edmonds, who joined the Providence Elder Place Peace Program about four years ago. Um, as we were chatting backstage, uh, it was clear that Jeremy has such a passion for serving, and I'm going to use your language, Jeremy. Um, I wrote it down, intentionally exploited communities and making sure that folks get the health care that they need and deserve. So thank you for your work doing that and the passion you're bringing us today in that space. Uh, she began as an enrollment and marketing on the on the enrollment and marketing team and has since moved into her current position as the outreach and marketing liaison for all of Western Washington. She provides education to various community partners, um, as she, you'll see live today, uh, including hospital, medical groups, assisted living communities, adult family homes, um, and senior citizens, and all of us today. So thank you, Jeremy. Uh, and in her personal life, she likes to read, watch sports, walk her dog Rosie, and spend time with friends and family. Um, she's a graduate of Boston University and a former Division I nationally ranked 800 meter runner with the distinction of racing against and losing badly to Flojo. So um, I had to read that part out loud. <laughs> Great anecdote. Thanks for sharing that with us, Jeremy. And last but not least, Kasharma Vahora is the Community Outreach Coordinator at Providence Elder Place PACE program in Seattle. So she works with Jeremy. Um, she is a born and raised Seattleite with a deep love for her community. And she's inspired by the local community organizers working towards health equity and justice. Um, currently, she supports the organization by building relationships with community-based organizations um, and conducting education like she's doing today as well as facilitating cultural care trainings for Providence Elder Place staff. Outside of this, she is a current graduate student at the University of Washington pursuing her master's in public health. So she's hardworking to say the least <laughs> to have full-time gig and get a graduate degree. So thanks for being here today. I guess we'll do just a super quick plug before we jump into questions, but if anyone out there is, um, dealing with an age-related issue, whether yourself or a family member, and many of us are, um, please do think of Community Living Connections as a resource. The number here is on your screen, 844-348-5464. It's kind of a, um, a one-stop open door to many different resources. So feel free to call this number and you can speak with someone live um, to figure out what programs and benefits you might be eligible for. And lastly, I think I'm going through the end of the slides, but we're just doing things in a different order today. <laughs> so I'll also remind folks to get a gold card if you have not yet done so. So if you are 60 and above, you are eligible for a gold card, which gives you discounts at a whole range of programs around Seattle or businesses rather, not programs. Um, so email us at agefriendly at seattle.gov and we will gladly send you your discount card. Okay, 
So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that we can just really have a conversation today instead of look at a PowerPoint. Okay, I think I have successfully done that. So again, if anyone in the room notices something's off, please do let me know. Um, and with that, I'm going to uh, just hand it over. I think I'll pass it to Dr. Love first. Um, if you can just kind of talk us through what the Seattle Indian Health Board does, um, your role there and the new um, location in Lake City. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um, so OCO everyone, um, I am Social Love Thurman, Dr. Love, as I, I usually say, just to make it easier and it's kind of fun. I love to be Dr. Love. Um, people say I embody that pretty well. <laughs> but um, I'm really honored to be with you all. I'm really excited to get to share with you about our organization and our clinic. Um, uh, at Seattle Indian Health Board, we are a federally qualified health center and an urban Indian health organization, which basically means we are kind of a catch-all clinic. We will see everybody in the community um, regardless of if you self-identify as being Native American or, or Alaska Native, which is our prime population that we really serve um, to the fullest um, in a Native way, we call it, but we see everybody. And we've been around since the 1950s uh, or 1970s um, through the civil rights era when a lot of Native people here in the Seattle and King County region uh, many times were displaced from their homelands and found themselves in this urban Indian center here in Seattle and often didn't have the healthcare resources or um, housing that they needed. And so this clinic was actually started by a bunch of women in our community, first as a volunteer clinic, and then now um, 52, 53 years later, we're still going. Um, we have our primary clinic site in the International District um, and seeing the needs of our community and where we needed to go to really serve, um, serve our community well, Lake City sort of opened up as a next location for us, um, as well as a clinical site in Pioneer Square um, with our partner, the Chief Seattle Club. So we've been in Lake City at our new site um, since October, so just about four months now. And so we're excited to be able to offer our services um, at all three of our clinical sites. And um, those services are for all people, all ages. Um, most of us who practice like myself are family medicine trained. And so we can see all ages. This morning I saw a bunch of kids, a lot of babies, um, but I love treating our elders as well. And um, we do medical services um, soon at the Lake City site. We will also be offering things like a dietary or foot care, which I know the Lake City Senior Center is really excited about. We just talked about some, some connection there for people who are really looking for good foot care. Um, in the future, we will also have at our Lake City site things like behavioral health, um, counseling or substance use treatment services. Um, we will also have a nutritionist and, um, and traditional Indian medicine. And I, I want to speak to that a little bit too about what that means. Um, but also in the coming month, we also are really excited to be able to launch. We have a mobile dental van um, that will be able to provide dental services and dental hygiene um, to our Lake City location once a week is the goal. And we hope to get that launched around probably April. And we're really trying to pair that service up at the same time as the North Helpline Food Bank um, does their food bank hours. So we're really, really excited about um, our expansion. And so I wanted to speak a little bit about what traditional Indian medicine is and what that could look like for people who are interested. So we do kind of your usual medical service delivery, you know, your primary care, your medication. But what we found is a lot of people don't really want um, that Western model of care. And what I love is that we offer traditional Indian medicine services to anyone 
Um, you don't have to be native to, um, to get those services, but it can look like things like um, smudging or um, ceremonies or prayer. Um, it also includes things like our medicinal um, medicines that we get from plants in this region that they can make into things like salves or creams, um, tea. I know our traditional Indian medicine team has often offered me um, certain types of tea when I've had colds and things like that. So it's just a really lovely service that really focuses more on the spiritual aspects of our health, um, which are so important and as important if not more important than all the other things that you see the doctor for. And so we're really excited to be able to offer just an array of traditional Indian medicine to anybody who might be kind of looking for alternative practice as well. Um, and then soon we'll be offering a podiatrist to come up to our Lake City location. We hired a full-time amazing podiatrist um, who is just wonderful. And um, she'll be able to move around to our different locations in the future, we hope to also deploy, we have a full-time acupuncturist and naturopathic doctor that we also hope to be able to offer as specialty services at all of our locations. So that's a hand, a, a little bit about what we do. We also offer things like enrollment for insurance. Um, we do have a nice lighting scale um, so that people who are uninsured or underinsured can also be able to get services at low cost. Um, we also offer services for people who are suffering with domestic violence or gender-based violence, um, housing insecurity, um, and we have special programming specifically for elders currently at our international district, which I hope to be able to expand to our Lake City as we grow. That's all. I have a million follow-up questions, Dr. Lab, but I'm going to save it for the next round. Um, thank you for providing just kind of a general overview of the services and who's eligible in your approach to medicine. Um, really interesting. So Jeremy and Krishma, I'm going to ask you now about Elder Place, um, which is part of a nationwide federally recognized program known as PACE, which stands for the Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what this means and who can access that program? Yeah, happy to do so. I'll start us off and then Jeremy can fill in. Um, PACE, like you said, stands for the Programs of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. It started in San Francisco um, with the Chinese American community over 50 years ago, um, and the need was... Um, to really help uh, Chinese American seniors age in place, age where they wanted to with their families and their loved ones. Um, and so the program formed to um, with the support of all the services that they need um, in achieving that goal. Um, so Providence Elder Place, each participant um, receives medical care, long-term care and social services. Um, so they have the support they need to age in place with loved ones. Um, in our clinics, we have about eight across Washington. We provide transportation to each site. Um, and in our clinics, you can find um, like an outpatient clinic, um, alongside adult family, um, adult day health, which is just a space for seniors to come in, eat breakfast, lunch, um, engage in activities. Um, and then we have a, a physical therapy gym um, to support our elders with accessing mobility um, and achieving the goals that they want to um, utilizing physical therapy and occupational therapy. Um, the eligibility to join our program is um, somewhat, they must be 55 years or older um, in need of support services um, as defined by the state of Washington. And that just means um, that they need assistance with three um, activities of daily living. So things that me and you do, driving, chores, toileting, um, bathing, three regular activities that we do that they need assistance with. Um, they must be able to live safely in the community. That just means that they have a permanent address that we can provide services to and pick them up from, um, that they are um, living in our service area. That includes Snohomish County, King County, and Spokane County for now. Um, and then that they are Medicaid eligible. 
Um, and I saw <clears throat> Jeremy posted a note in the chat too. So, um, and I, I did want to follow up on just, can you maybe Jeremy, this is a question for you talk a sure. little bit about the transportation that people can get. Absolutely. Um, I'm we're incredibly proud of our transportation department as they are part of our medical team. And I guess that's where we need to start. We have medical teams of 13 to 15 professionals called IDTs or interdisciplinary teams, which the drivers are a part of. And just to run through that rudimentary model quickly with the driver, you'd have a primary care physician, two ARNPs, a nurse case manager and two LPNs, three CNAs, who we call personal care attendants, a complement, a complement of therapies uh, and therapists, speech therapy, rec therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, the pharmacy team. We have spiritual counseling. We have Muslim and Christian chaplains on every team. We provide home health social work and case management, and then the driver and the site manager. That is a, a skeletal form, could be more, but it's always those components on the team. And thus the driver is a very per important part of the team because often that's the first face of elder place that a new participant in our program is going to see. We provide all medically supported transportation. It's not just to and from the clinic. If we have to have a, a relationship, let's say someone needs to go to the poly clinic because they need some, we have a contract with them. That's a medically supported ride. We'll pick them up and take them there. We aren't gonna provide social rides such as to church or the library or the grocery store. But when you understand that the current participant and the, uh, the, the, the current stereotype, for lack of a better word, or the model or paradigm of a current PACE participant. This is a person that takes an, an average seven and a half medications a month because they have nine and a half chronic conditions. And you can best believe when someone is that frail and we're trying to support them to live successfully and as independently as they can, they're gonna need more than three medically supported rides a month, which is what many of our Medicare partners and long-term care partners provide. Our transportation benefit is unlimited. And then the last point of pride I'd like to say is that since the beginning of, that, of our pandemic here across the United States, as we know, Seattle <clears throat> was ground zero for the very first COVID patient to ever hit the United States and they were treated at Providence Hospital in Everett. So we have a very deep understanding of what COVID has done and how profoundly it's affected seniors. Our transportation department has done north of 125,000 trips since the onset of the pandemic with zero exposures through our transportation department. And so I say that with a huge source of pride that that's the commitment that we're extending from the beginning to every single person who meets with us. When a typical person comes in and an elder comes in to enroll in PACE, the very first time we sit and meet with them, we're gonna ask them what their goals of care are. Tell us, is it better diet? Is it better ability to walk? Is it relationships with your family? Is it to get your hypertension and diabetes under control? And as long as they can physically stand it, the very first time they're in our clinic, they're gonna be seen for a minimum of an hour and a half so that we can have the doctor, the nurses, and one of the other disciplines, whether it's diet or maybe the, uh, a therapist based on the feedback they gave us, that's gonna sit with them and come up with a complete baseline. And I can tell you, as a woman of color, when I went to go get care at Harborview, I have a doctor who's got a patient panel of 1,500 patients. And when he came in to see me, he met with me for 10 minutes and he was out the door. With nine medical teams and 13 people on every team, we're currently treating 1,148 people. That figures to be under 130 patients per panel. That means personalized attention, aggressive care planning, proactiveness to keep you out of the hospital. And as a result, with the utilization rates right now running for seniors over eight days on average, if they just have Medicare alone, we have been able in the past 30 years to get well close to 90% of our highly fragile elders out of the hospital, going back safely and happily into the community to live their lives in under eight days. That's what we're about keeping people in the community to live the life they want, to age in place. The faster we can get to that elder, 
who had needs help with three ADLs. Maybe it's medication management. Maybe it's transportation. Maybe it's better um, how to, you know, they need queuing dressing and they need home chores. The faster we can intercede, the better the outcome. It's amazing um, to, to think about that level of personalized care. So just to kind of recap what you, what I heard you say, uh, each individual patient essentially has access to a theme a theme, a team of 13 professionals who range from, uh, you know, all kinds of medical fields and include the driver. Um, and you work with each individual to come up with a personalized care plan based on their unique goals. Yes, we're open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And with the onset of the pandemic, we needed to, to, to pivot on a dime to figure out how to serve these vulnerable elders, because we all know that's who COVID came after. Nationally, when you look at the rates of COVID infection in skilled nursing facilities, at last count in September of 2020, 694,780 cases of COVID-19 were, in, were initiated in a congregate or nursing home setting. For that same demographic of population, folks who need nursing home level care, but choose to get it through a PACE program, you ready for the number nationally of COVID cases PACE programs dealt with? 8,964. So we've done a very successful job of keeping these people healthy. And one of the ways that we did it is we're open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we offer our uh, participants what's known as a grand pad, which is a actual Kindle, like a small handheld computer that has bigger buttons on it for their IDT, call your family, call your medical team, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have a doctor on call, a nurse case manager on call, and an admin person who can provide comfort, care, advice, and support in real time. Amazing. And I think it's so great that your program, and as I understood it, Sharma, um, is really grounded in helping people age in place at home. Because as we know, the majority of older folks uh, would like to stay in their homes and even more importantly, in the communities that they love and are familiar with. So thank you for the work you're doing. I want to also add yeah. one other point, if, if I may. Sure. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm 60 years old, and I have a son who's 23 and a mother who's 82. It's not just also for the elders. This is a holistic program with the family and the participant, because we don't refer to our patients as patients. We prefer them or refer to them as participants, because we want to empower them to participate in their healthcare. They are at the center of that wheel of that team in everything that we do. It is also for the family. There are so many adult children who have aging parents. They're like the meat of the sandwich. That's how I think of myself. The bun is my mom who's gonna need me to support her at some point. And here I am, I'm the ham in that sandwich because I'm a ham, I'm just saying it. And then the <laughs> bottom is, the, is my son. And that means I've got people pulling at me in different ways. If my mom is here and she's in Washington, I will enroll my mom in a PACE program. Why? She doesn't need it yet. But when she does, I'm going to have the peace of mind that someone's going to be loving on my mother and supporting my mother in her in the quality of her life without having me to, uh, to, to drive her to the doctor or to be there as a, as a medical escort or to make sure that she's having a good day. She can go to the pay center and be with people her own age and play all the bridge she wants. That's what this is about. And so it provides a ton of peace of mind for those adult children who have aging parents and need some help too. Yeah, and that's an increasing, increasing number of folks out there mm -hmm. experiencing that. Um, so Dr. Love, I want to go back to you and kind of ask um, some follow-up questions on some things that you raised. First, before I forget, can you quickly provide everyone with the address of the Lake City location? Yes, thank goodness I have it right here. <clears throat> um, it is 12736 33rd Avenue Northeast, and that's suite 200, so second floor. And that's Seattle, Washington, 98125. Thank you for that. So folks in the room, um, 
if anyone needs that information, hopefully we can get that passed around to and written down. Yeah, um, I think it's a little easier to just, um, it's in the McDermott house, which is directly attached to the North Healthline Food Bank. Um, so if you're going to the food bank, we're just kind of to the left of that. Um, I don't know what direction that is, um, but it's in the McDermott house, um, second floor. So you just need to take the elevator up. As you okay. go Perfect. Thank you. Um, and one more um, reminder, and this is to folks who are in the room. Uh, there are some colleagues of mine who are there and they will pass out some blank slips of paper and pens. And we encourage you to write down any questions you have in real time. Uh, if you need help getting your written question interpreted, I believe the interpreters can help with that. And those questions will be relayed to me and I'll share them with our panelists. So thank you in advance for your participation. Um, so Dr. Love, going back to uh, the Seattle Indian Health Board, you mentioned that you provide um, care in, I think you said the native way, and you shared a couple examples of what that might look like, but I would love to know a little bit more about, um, what that approach is and kind of the um, fundamentals of it. And then also you mentioned that anybody is eligible to access your service. Um, so how do people, um, sort of, I guess, react to that approach? Are people familiar with it? Are they excited to, to um, receive care in a new way for them? So if you can talk us through that. Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> I, I often will sort of give people the, the, how it feels when you walk in. Um, we, it, it actually happened during the pandemic that we really started using a lot of our, our older our plant medicines um, in the pandemic because we knew that the the air quality and the viral spread was was so heavy in our in our clinics and our communities that we really we always kind of think about what are those traditional ways or values that we as native people will often go to that we've had for for many centuries and so one of those things is um, the use of smudge um, medicines like cedar um, or sage or sometimes our staff will use um, sweet grass, um, depending on what, where they're from or what, what tribal affiliation they are. But we really started using um, that plant medicine, that, that ceremony of smudging our building um, during the pandemic. Again, we sort of brought that sort of teaching back. And so every day when we have our traditional Indian medicine team on board, they will go around our building and they sludge our building in the morning and in the afternoon. And it's a way of um, grounding us sort of in um, our traditional ways. It's a, you'll smell the medicine and it's just like a reminder. It's almost like a, it can be a really familiar or comforting smell for a lot of people too. But beyond that, we actually, science shows that those sorts of medicine actually do have an antibacterial or antiviral property. And so it actually is an act of kind of cleansing the air that we're all breathing as well. So we actually brought that practice back um, and still do that to this day. So I'll be in clinic and I'll be seeing people and then all of a sudden I'll just smell this medicine or you'll walk into our building and you just smell that medicine. And it's just like, it almost will startle people sometimes because they're like, wow, what is that? Um, and some of our native people who come will just, it just feels like home. It feels comforting to walk in. So I always kind of set that stage of often that's what you'll experience when you come to our clinic is that immediate like, whoa. <laughs> but beyond that, we're still a pretty small clinic. And so we at our current location at the international district, we see only about 5,200 um, people every year. So we are one of the smallest um, community health centers in the Seattle area. And in some ways, it's really nice because when you walk in, you'll often be recognized. We try to recognize our, we call our patients our relatives. Um, we see all of the people who come in as our aunties, our uncles, our grandmas, our grandpas, our daughters, our brothers, our friends. And so we actually don't call our patients our patients, we call them our relatives. And we really hold that value of, of treating people that way. Um, treating your bun <laughs> on, on the top and the bottom, 
um, with such love and respect. And so a lot of people are known by their first name. They're known by their tribal affiliation um, when they walk in our building. And when we treat them, we do really look at their whole, we, we use a medicine wheel. We think about people um, with their mind, their body, their spirit, and their physical health as all being absolutely critical to have health. Um, and so regardless of who you are, what background you have, I think people feel good walking in knowing that we're not just gonna talk to you about your medicine, um, your, you know, counsel you on your high blood pressure or you need to eat better, but like actually really have a conversation around, you know, do you have access to healthy foods? Do you have access to traditional foods? Um, are you connected with people, loved ones, friends, family? Um, and we immediately try to connect people to services. And so, you know, we have, we certainly don't have 13 professionals and I love that and wanna to get to a place where we have that many people, but we do have a lot of people who will wrap, wrap around care for you, um, whether that be the provider you're seeing that connects you with our traditional Indian medicine team or nutrition. Uh, we have three nutritionists on staff. Um, you might meet with a clinical pharmacist, which is really great if you've got a bunch of medications or you have questions or you don't know how to quite use your insulin or you're having issues that we have pharmacists who can come in the room and talk to you. Um, we have soon to be social work um, who can be really helpful. We have care coordinators because one of the hardest parts about medicine is navigating the system, right? And I hope for a day in my lifetime where it's easier. But when you're trying to navigate your specialty appointments or even internally, if you're wanting to meet with different people within our clinical system, we have people who can help sort of navigate that and help schedule those appointments or call that specialty doctor's office that you're having trouble getting into. Um, and so we, we provide a lot of wraparound services. And I think that, that people will leave kind of surprised that they got so much done in one visit, which I love. You know, We don't wanna have to go to the doctor a lot. We wanna be able to go there and get as much done as possible. So we really try to take the time to meet the needs that you have. Um, as much as possible in one day as you're open to doing. Some people are like, I just want to go. And we're like, okay, that's fine. You can go. But if you don't, if you want to stay, we have, you know, we have other things we can offer you. So that's a little bit about kind of how we treat people in the native way. Like you will be our relative if you come. And you had another question that I'm already blanking on. And me too. I was so absorbed in <laughs> listening to you, Sarah. Um, um, yes, I don't, I don't recall what it was, but we can come back to it too. Um, so I, I am sensing a real theme between both of your organizations, both around the personalization of care and recognizing that people are whole people and have many different facets and require many, have many different needs that can be met in different ways, um, as well as this kind of these wraparound services. So um, that's exciting thinking about quality care. Um, I think I'm going to ask a question to the PACE team. And this is a question that's coming from an audience member at Lake City. But perhaps you can use it as a jumping off point to also talk about how someone might enroll the eligibility process for your mm -hmm. program, um, the insurance side of things, mm -hmm. who's eligible, with what kind of insurance, what's the payments look like. Um, and so the question is, my sister is enrolled at Kaiser Permanente. Mm -hmm. uh, how can she transfer to the Elder Place program? She lives alone. If she lives in your unit, how much will she have to pay monthly? She is not on Medicaid. Sure. Okay. Let's talk a couple. There's a whole lot going on in that question I need to interrupt or to backtrack. But there's one thing I truly want to say that Dr. Love said that I think I'm so proud to hear her say, because I believe that both of our organizations are operating in this way. And the term is whole person centered care. That's what we're providing. Both of our organizations and Dr. Love, I do not mean to speak for you, but I know that's what you would agree with that. It's about when she's talking about calling people relatives and auntie, and we're talking about empowering people, it's whole person centered care. Like Dr. Love said, people have many different needs besides just being a person on a paper. We're not any of us 
the sum of what we are on a piece of paper. And, and Dr. Love also mentioned how important advocacy is when you're working with um, intentionally exploited communities and how you've got to advocate and empower people. We do that at PACE. I just want to say on a personal aside, I um, just went through a horrible experience on vacation out of state where I ended up having to be hospitalized in San Diego for six days, my entire vacation. I saw nothing but a palm tree, honest to God. And here I am, I work in healthcare and I'm an African-American woman with a college degree. And because of my dehydration and my potassium level dropping to two with a blood pressure over 200 over 84, I couldn't advocate for myself. Nobody listened to me. I asked them to not give me really awful medications. They did it anyway. And what I've learned in this process is that women in general are not listened to in the medical community. Women of color are dismissed. And if we think about it, think about the little old lady in, in like, like the one I'm, woman I'm about to talk about living alone, who doesn't have anybody to advocate for her, who doesn't have anybody checking on her regularly to make sure she's eating well, taking her medications on time, getting to the doctor and not falling down. That's what whole person care is about. You've got to be able to address those needs on an everyday basis. Now, Back to your question, because I needed to get that out. Would you mind repeating it for me? And Krishma, do you want to start? And then I'll fill in whatever else you don't say. Could you repeat the question though? Okay, thank you. Sure, yeah. So I'll repeat the question from um, that's from a participant in the chat and then mm -hmm. feel free to extrapolate sure. so everyone can get the information too. So the question is, my sister is enrolled at Kaiser. How can she transfer to the Elder Place program? She lives alone. If she lives in your unit, how much will she have to pay monthly? She is not on Medicaid. Okay. Do you want to start or do you want me to start? You start. Go ahead. Jeremy. Okay. First off, we accept enrollments because we're a Medicaid program every single month until the 23rd of the month to begin subsequent onboarding and services the first. And that's a feature of Medicaid. So you know when you're looking every year at your own Medicare and you got Joe Namath and Jimmy Walker JJ screaming at you, enroll, enroll, enroll in Kaiser United or Molina. We're not limited to that. PACE is paid for by traditional health care uh, funding, government funding, Medicare from the federal government, Medicaid from the state government. Like the Indian Health Board, we are a wraparound, coordinated, managed care program done through a health maintenance organization. What that means is there are no co-pays and no deductibles once a person enrolls in the PACE program. One other factor, as of July 1st of last year, 2022, the state of Washington raised the personal needs allowance to $2,522 a month. So if an elder is living independently and their monthly income that they receive is less than, even by a dollar, $2,521 or below, PACE, the services are entirely free. And that is a huge stress relief because many elders worry about how they're going to come up with a copay or a deductible if they have to go from the hospital to, an, to a skilled nursing facility. That's a burden. That burden is relieved. You don't have that burden anymore because we're going to pay it. And we pay everything. We pay for all prescriptions. We pay for all over-the-counter medications. We pay for all durable medical equipment up through including electric hospital beds and power PMD devices. Mm -hmm. How a person accesses care is two ways. One, they need to do a, an assessment through the state be, to qualify for Medicaid services or to, to, to also, I'm sorry, not, not to qualify. They need to do an assessment of the state to make sure they meet the threshold of needing help with three tasks of daily living. Wait, yep, sure. Jer Jeremy, can I just oh, uh, sure. I hold you one second, just because mm -hmm. I want to make sure that this is clear to everyone. So sure. um, let me repeat back what yep. I believe you said. Sure. So people can enroll in the PACE program if they have Medicaid and that enrollment happens every month, unlike mm -hmm. 
many different yeah. programs. So mm -hmm. it's on a, a rolling basis on a monthly application. That's Correct. for Medicaid. And people who are in Medi who have Medicare are also able to access the PACE Correct. program. Correct. And, and they have the same ability. They don't, they can roll in at any time. We, our social workers will help folks get what they're missing. If someone, every once in a while you come across this, an elder who doesn't have Medicare, as odd as it sounds, our social workers will help that person happen. Every single intake rep, myself included, can help anyone do a Medicaid application because they're very complicated and there's a lot of language and a lot of it doesn't make sense. We've all been trained in helping people access Medicaid, whether they join PACE or not doesn't okay. matter. We want them to have access to the health care that they deserve. Honestly, at Providence Elder Place, we were saying this well before Joe Biden, health care is a right and not a privilege. And one of the ways you make that accessible to people is you help them with the things that are difficult. And Lord knows, Washington Plan Health Finder is a difficult process to go through. <laughs> so. Yes. So, okay, this is really great information. So just to reiterate, Medicaid, Medicare, and typically the qualification to qualify for those for Medicaid enrollment would be making as much or less than $2,522. Anything below that, no copay, no deductibles, no participation fee, PACE is free Great. and always will be. So if a person is earning below that $2,522 mm -hmm. amount, mm -hmm. but they, for whatever reason, have not yet enrolled in the Medicaid program, they are eligible and yep. you can help them get enrolled. Yes. yes. Okay. That is then, great. Yes. And then to answer the follow-up questions, um, just to clarify, this isn't a place to live. We are outpatient clinic. Um, and so, uh, just to clarify that. And then for her sister or loved one that wants to enroll, um, you can call the number that is on my background, 206-320-5325, or I can, um, if they want, um, I can get them directly connected to our enrollment specialist in the Seattle area that can support with answering questions and um, start the enrollment process. Great. So, couple things to point out and also um, a reminder to us as um, speakers and panelists, we're being asked if we can slow down just a bit for the interpreters in the room. So note to myself as well. Um, and uh, Krishma, just to reiterate what you said, um, the PACE program aims to help people age in place. So where they're currently living, um, it, the PACE program is not a physical place where someone would come to live. However, you do have physical locations where someone could come spend the day, get a meal, enjoy some social activity. Did I That's capture right. that right? Okay. Yes. And also we do partner with adult family homes and assisted living facilities. And so say if they're looking to um, live in those spaces, that's also included in the in the in the cost of our program. Great. And then I also got a message in the chat. Someone in the room is asking about transportation. Um, and I think this is a common question. A lot of people struggle to get transportation to the various medical appointments that they need. Mm -hmm. And I know that PACE provides transportation to your um, care specifically. Um, but if folks are needing transportation to medical appointments outside of the PACE program, mm -hmm. I do want to provide a resource. Um, you but, can, oh, and do you we, all offer them? Yes, we do. Oh, so all medically <laughs> assisted trips. Yeah. So uh, we schedule the medical, your medical appointments with your specialist. Say you have an appointment um, at the Swedish campus with your specialist. We can provide you um, trips to that appointment. Say you have dialysis um, week, weekend mornings. We can provide transportation to your dialysis appointment and back to your place. And that's um, even, sorry to interrupt, but I just want to be clear that that's even if you are not enrolled in the PACE program. No, you must be enrolled in the okay, PACE program. Okay. Good yes. clarification. Yeah. Yes. So if you're enrolled in the PACE program, you all handle transportation in a major way, which is great. Yes. But um, I do want to provide a resource. 
uh, to folks who are not enrolled in the PACE program because I know transportation is a big need. Um, so I'm going to, again, read out loud the number for the community living connections. And if you call this number, you can speak to someone about your particular situation and transportation needs, and they can help you get connected with the service you might be eligible for. So the phone number is one 348 5464 and I might ask my colleagues in the room if you would write that down for the person who, who might need it. That'd be great. Oh, and it's in the chat as well. So thanks, colleagues, for, for posting that. Um, okay, thank you. This was a lot of great information. Um, and I want to do a quick time check with my colleagues also and, and be sure we're keeping track of time. So if someone needs to ping me, feel free. I'd like to answer Dr. Love's question. If a PACE participant really wants to keep their doctor, we recognize that many, because as Dr. Love knows, health maintenance organizations, one of the rules is that you must see the primary care provider associated with that team. But at Providence Elder Place, we, I'm trying to slow down for the interpreter. <laughs> we also recognize that many elders have long-term relationships with their doctors. And what Providence Elder Place will do is provide four transitional visits once a quarter, like a social visit to go back and see your doctor and say, hey, Dr. Love, this is what Elder Place wants to do with me. What do you think? The only caveat is we ask, please don't, which you, no doctor would. I just, I'm saying this more for the, the uh, audience than Dr. Love, but all we ask is that if the doctor says, hey, I think they need to do this test, or I think they should be you on this drug, call the PCP at Elder Place, have that professional conversation, which I think all doctors genuinely do anyway. And yes, we will pay for four visits once a quarter for them to go see their old doctor to make sure that they're at peace with the decision that they've made. And then one final thing, this is a program of choice. A person can enroll, disenroll, and re-enroll again. And I'm gonna be honest, we have had one participant at our Columbia City location, bless her heart, who's enrolled and disenrolled five times. There is some, there's obviously something going on with her in, 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 her, in her mental health, I believe, but who cares? It's her right. <laughs> He can come with us as many times as she wants. And then lastly, like the Indian Health Board, we provide behavioral health, substance use disorder treatment um, through uh, some of our, our contracted partners, Village Plan, Cascade Behavioral Health. And quite frankly, we need to get in a contract with the Indian Health Board because we need to work together. That's just the bottom line. So it's always great when you meet someone else in the community who thinks the way you do. It's so heartening. And I just have, I just want you to know, Dr. Love, I've just become, I'm kind of fan crushing over here. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, I've taken so many notes. <laughs> Full um, of love. On theme with Dr. Love. Um, <laughs> So I, we've been talking about transportation a bit, so I'm going to ask a question that we talked about when we prepped, but I um, hope this isn't out of left, left field because transportation can be really challenging, but luckily we have access to so many technologies now, like the one we're using today, where people don't necessarily physically have to go somewhere all of the time. So um, maybe I'll start with you, Dr. Love, but I'd love to hear from both of your organizations um, how are you operating and exploring access in this in this virtual space? Yes, um, it's such an important um, topic. And um, I think when we were prepping for this, I was just um, so happy that um, telehealth services have been expanded again um, through federal legislation. So we are thrilled because there was a, a period of time when we were pretty concerned um, because we've gotten so used to this, really this luxury and actually it's not even a luxury, it's really a need um, that we learned in the pandemic um, for the importance of accessibility for people to be able to have visits via video or phone. 
So yes, we do provide telehealth services um, primarily by phone uh, to, to anybody. There are only a couple criteria that we have to meet for that. The person has to be in the state of Washington. And currently at our clinic, the only thing that we can't do by phone is um, uh, suboxone refills, which is a whole nother issue that uh, many times you can get your suboxone or your medically assisted treatment by phone, but it's our insurance broker that doesn't allow us to do that. But we can do just about anything else by phone. So even for example, this morning, many of you might have experienced the snow we did down in the international district. And so I was in clinic this morning, but we actually called the relatives that were scheduled and just switched many of our in-person visits into phone visits, um, which actually made my, my one of my elder relatives very, very happy that she could still have her visit without having to, to trek into the, the elements to get here. So we do offer both phone and in-person visits and you just have to call and, and let them know which one you wanna do when you're scheduling. Um, I will also add that we also do phone and video visits for behavioral health. So for your counseling, which has been really beneficial as well to open up the accessibility to more people. Yeah, so yeah. That's great. And what about at, in the um, at Elder Place? Yeah. So um, we also have telehealth services. Um, and like Jeremy mentioned earlier, we also provide um, after a participant has been enrolled in our program for at least three months, um, they are um, they are given a grand pad and it's just an iPad with larger buttons um, where they can access their doctor um, and their care team. So their social workers, um, their adult day health activities coordinator. Um, and then we also have been, yeah, I think telehealth and GrandPad are our two biggest things, right, Jeremy? Telehealth for a variety of things. We could have simplified the enrollment process so that if a person has fear, we can FaceTime with our phones and lock them through the clinic and enroll and send the documents by fax or email if they know they want to do that. We also use the grand pads to provide uh, telehealth visits if for mental health, to our, our on-staff psychiatrist, our on-staff geriatric psychiatrist. And that leads me to that every member of our 13 to 15 IDT team that I discussed earlier is certified in geriatric care and in understanding the aging human body. And I think that's vitally important for the people that we serve. So we do have these Kindles that have built-in Wi-Fi. They are given to the participant. There's no cost involved. As long as they're in the PACE program, that grand pad is for them. It can have telehealth visits. It could have social work visits. You could do a doctor's visit. I've taught a current events class. We even teach exercise classes in Amharic and in Spanish. So it's been a game changer in keeping all of us, as Dr. Love has mentioned, keeping people connected to their caregivers. Um, all amazing things. And you know, it's just it's so incredible how much access has increased given these tools and given the circumstances that lent some political wealth to expanding access this way. Yeah. And one last thing that I forgot to mention, we also have pace at home where um, if our participants don't feel comfortable coming or just mobily can't come to our site, um, our care team goes to them. Um, so, you know, their PCP um, social worker will go and meet them in their homes and provide yeah. the services that they need. So people can really get care wherever they are. They can come to you, with, you can give them a ride, they can chat, text, video, and you can come to them. Mm -hmm. So I am getting questions fast and furious. So, uh, so Shara, Dr. Love, this one is for you. Um, question on natural medicine. Where is the clinic? So maybe you can just repeat the um, general location again. Um, where do I pay for the herbs? Do you have interpretation services at the clinic? Yes. Um, so our Lake City Clinic location, um, the address is 12736. 33rd Avenue Northeast, Suite 200, Seattle, 
98125. And that's again located right next to the North Helpline Food Bank. If you are driving, you can actually park in the Fred Meyer parking lot, which is just directly across the street from us. And we do offer video interpretation services at all of our clinical locations in over a hundred different languages, including sign language. And for our plant medicines, um, we currently offer those as a part of your visit. Um, we aren't currently charging for those medications. In the future, we might have um, either low, low cost on our sliding scale, or, um, you know, eventually we hope that um, insurance companies will start to pay for this. This is actually something we're working on. But for now, um, most of the plant medications or the salves or the teas that you might get are all included um, through some grant funding that we have, that we can provide that. Um, I did not mention too that we do have pharmacy on site at our Lake City, at all of our locations, we have pharmacy. And because of the way that our pharmacy works, we are able to get a lot of different medications at really low cost through our 340B contract. And so there are certain medications, especially with our Medicare population, that may be very expensive at another retail pharmacy that we can get at very low cost um, for, for relatives. So that's something to think about too. And we can help um, do the cost and help figure that out for people. But the plant or herbal medications and teas are, are covered with your visit. That's great to know. And a um, couple more questions for you, Dr. Love, and I've got and I've got a couple questions for everyone um, quickly, because I know we have to wrap up at three. Um, and I want to make sure you all get time for kind of some final thoughts on your end. But um, Dr. Love, can you remind us again, um, are you open to people who are not Native? Yes, yes, we are open to everybody, all ages. And are all of your um, doctors, providers Native? Ooh, good question. No, but I think the current breakdown is that over 50% of our providers um, are do identify as Native American or Alaska Native, but on our current staff, 80% of our staff are BIPOC or Black, Indigenous, or people of color. So 80% of our current entire staff identify as BIPOC. So most of the MPs or the nurses or the providers you see will be people of color, many of them native. And you mentioned at one point that um, many of your native staff are coming from different tribes and bringing the diversity of their traditions and experiences with them. So for another day would be so interested mm -hmm. to dive into what that looks like. Um, so I'm going to ask kind of a rapid fire question to all of you, which is, um, can you tell us how much, well, first of all, I'm going to, I'll do this in different rounds. So first question is, are your services available to non-citizens? So um, uh, whoever wants to take that one first, then it'd be great to hear from both of you. Works. It depends. It has to do with how the state of Washington in terms of Medicaid qualifies them. Um, certainly if someone is an, an alien resident with a green card, it doesn't present any problems, but there are different medical programs and perhaps Dr. Love and even Krishma might know more about this, that the state designates for, non -im for immigrants and, and non-citizens of this country that preclude us from enrolling them in PACE. Usually what we do is work on it on a case by case basis. And I have a direct contact to the long term care director slash manager of PACE. And when we have those questions, we just present them on an individual basis. I have enrolled a woman who is 92 who had dual citizenship in Mexico and the United States. She was eligible to be covered. I had another gentleman of Asian descent who'd lived here many years, but because of his status, he he wanted to be in pace, but the system, the mechanisms of Medicaid dictated he had to be in another in another situation. Krishna, did you have anything to add to that? No, it's it's okay. honestly case by case. Um, 
So it sounds like if someone is wondering whether or not they qualify, they could just get in touch and you would help them sort yep. that out. Yeah. And then um, Dr. Love, do you have anything to add from your yeah. perspective? Yeah, so we will see um, everybody, regardless of your ability to pay um, or your you know, documentation, uh, your status. So um, oftentimes you will need to be on a sliding scale um, for our services, which um, we, we have a very good sliding scale, but there may be some payment um, needed for visits, but we try to keep that cost very low. And if you are able to be enrolled in Medicaid, we do have the enrollment specialist who can try to, to set you up. But yes, we, we see all people. And there's a few questions in here that I'm going to do my best to synthesize what I've already heard you say. So let me know if I get it wrong. And then I'll hand it back to each of your organizations to just maybe wrap us up with one thing you'd like us to take away. Um, I know I've just heard that we've got a hard out in the room where folks are at three. So I want to be sure we get through all of this before people are dispersed. Um, so I know, Dr. Love, you shared that you have translation services available via video. Um, and that means not just on teleconference or telehealth visits, but really in person in the provider's office, you can use video translation services. So I think I got that right. And then is that the case with the PACE program as well? That is correct. Okay, great. So that answers the translation services. So short answer, yes, translation services available at both organizations. And then um, there's a question, how much does it cost for a consultation, doctor fee and medication? I'm going to guess that might be a complicated question. So I think my best attempt at an answer is that it depends, but that both of your organizations have sliding fee scales and, or, or, Dr. Love, you all have sliding fee scales for folks who are not um, qualified through an insurance program for free services, mm -hmm. and that the PACE program is generally completely free for people who are accessing it via Medicaid and Medicare services. That's correct. Okay. And so, medication is covered in that. That's great. That's a big expense, so good to know. So... Um, before, so I'll give you all a second to collect your thoughts and then we can, uh, I'll invite you to close us out. Um, and before I do, I want to remind folks who are in the room that we do have some evaluation forms. This is new for us. And so thank you for uh, experimenting with us. We really want to make these events as useful as possible to folks who are watching them. So thank you for helping us do that. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back to our panelists. So Dr. Love, I'll start with you. What would you like to leave us with today? Well, just a lot of gratitude. I mean, I feel like I um, am happy to be able to share our services and I feel hopeful knowing even what I've learned from our partners at PACE about the healthcare system and, and in so many ways how broken it is, but then the hope when we find programs like our clinic um, and the PACE program that really are for everyone. And it's, it's high quality care that everyone deserves. Um, and so I'm just, I have a lot of gratitude um, and uh, I'm honored that I was able to join you all today. I hope that, uh, I wish I could see everybody in the room, but um, I'm really happy that uh, I was given this opportunity. And I just want people to know that uh, Seattle Indian Health Board sometimes can be thought of as only serving Indian or Native people, but I really want people to know that we are here to serve all people in the Native way, which I think is actually really amazing, and I hope that people will consider taking part in that type of care. Um, thank you, everyone, so much for joining us, and thank you for the organizers for hosting us. Um, I'm also just fangirling at the uh, conversation and the information we learned today. Um, but to close out, I just want to say, if you have any questions about any of our services, feel free to reach out to Dr. Love or me or Jeremy, and we'll be happy to connect you um, and answer any follow-up questions that you may have. Um, I know we do, we did provide, um, 
brochures and information and uh, feel free to you know call the number on there again 206-320-5325 um, and then we can also and Jeremy we can also drop our um, contact information in the chat but thank you Jeremy, do you want to leave us with any any of your thoughts? Yes, thank you. I was trying to type and doing a poor job of it. Now we know I can't do more than one thing at the same time. So I just want people to understand and, and hopefully understand that, that this program is here to help you age in place. It's, we're not interested in putting you in the hospital or putting you in a nursing home. It is about connection. It's about relationship. It's about community. It's about providing care from the moment we meet you through the end of life. It's about for intentionally exploited communities to understand and access the services that are available to them. And it is, I'm sure, a passion of every single one of us on this, on this panel that we make sure that we keep all of us healthy because we are only as healthy as a society as we are individually. And I just wanted to express my gratitude to you, Dinah, my gratitude to Dr. Love, my gratitude to Eldad, to Aging King County and the Seattle Public Libraries and the living the community living connections, all of us together, we all need to keep each other close and to make this the foundation of us moving forward and working together in any way we can to make this, this a reality for us all. Healthcare is a right, not a privilege, and it's for everyone. And at Elder Place, that's what we're trying to do. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for letting me be a part of today. The pleasure and honor was all mine. No, it was not all yours. This was great. I really appreciate all of you being here. I think we all have as uh, participants as well are sharing. So amazing women, amazing work, um, amazing organizations. Thank you for teaching us about them. I'm also logging off today full of gratitude for people like yourselves who are doing this innovative and not always easy work. So thank you for charging a better path for healthcare for all of us. So with that, I will sign us off of the March Civic Coffee, but thank you to the three of you and thank you to everyone for joining us today. And we'll see you next month. Thank you, everyone. Bye.